fight about this. All right. Okay. Eminem and Christmas. What the hell? You guys, you guys like that? What the hell? It's not. I know your grandma told you that, huh? Oh, <laughs> no, don't. Okay. Oh, I don't like that. Like that. <laughs> what? No, don't mess up. You can only, you can only you cuss can't. your kids out at home, but in church you can't. What up, cuz? The Armenian name. Alright. I want to um, talk about this subject because you guys know Christmas is coming up, I think. Is it? Yes. 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 No, it's not coming up, Jack. So, uh, so I want to talk about this issue. I think some of you guys are saying, what the hell? Like, how does this Eminem relate to Christmas? Hopefully, you guys will see here in a bit. Like, if this thing works, technology. Okay. All right. A little bit of background. Anyone who doesn't know anything about Eminem, VH1, the uh, authority on music artists. Protege of Dr. Dre, rapper Eminem, emerged in 1999 as one of the most controversial rappers. You guys know that. Some of you guys know more about him than I do. So he was born at Marshall. Uh, he was born Marshall Mathers in St. Joseph, um, spending the better part of his impoverished childhood shuttling back and forth between his hometown and the city of Detroit. They're loud. Um, I went to Detroit, man. It was a trip. You know, I went actually on Eight Mile. And, and and saw where he lived in straight ghetto, but that's another story. Initially attracted to rap as a teen, Eminem began performing at age 14, performing raps in the basement of his high school friend's home. But you guys know he came out as an underground rapper. Yeah. Actually, he rapped in places like Project Glow here in LA, was part of the whole uh, battle scene there before he became popular. If anyone ever wants to go to Project Glow, you can go on a Thursday night. Um, they usually start. They opened it up around 11 p.m. That's where like a lot of great rappers came out of uh, Jurassic uh, Five, Amon, Pigeon John, Swan. Uh, many many great artists. Uh, 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 he, uh, also uh, Black Eyed Peas came out of this whole Project Glow. It used to be called um, the Good Life Cafe. Some Muslims opened, bought a cafe and, and told a bunch of youth in the 80s, early 90s, that they could have a place to rap. So uh, the Good Life Cafe every week was like an open mic where rappers, poets would go, and out of that, all that talent came out. Then they left and started Project Glow because the, the black Muslims were making them uh, censor their music. They couldn't cuss and stuff, you know. So they said, you know what, we're going to start our own place. And then many great rappers before they got famous like Eminem have went through that place and did park battles. And, and uh, so it's, it's an interesting place to go to. It's at the Mur Park. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the longest. Um, underground hip-hop spot in LA so uh, like I said many great talent has come through there uh, it's a good experience to go there and Eminem is one of those people you know he went there was involved in different battles um, but he began performing age 14 performing raps in the basement of his high school friend's home uh, the two went under the names Mannix and Eminem soon changed to Eminem with uh, Mathers took from his own initials due to the unavoidable racial boundaries that came with being a white rapper he decided the easiest way to win over underground hip hop, because the underground scene is very racial, um, as far as uh, commercial white rappers who basically just um, are into selling albums and not really saying anything deep. And that's why Eminem has a, That's why he's loved because he's so deep, and he has an underground style to Dre's commercial beats. You know what I'm saying? He's you know like I was listening. I was listening to Game and, and looking at his lyrics this week. He's he's just he's shallow. He's not saying anything. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know how long it's going to last the game. We had a good discussion about that last night, me, Pete, and, and Abu and a couple other people. We're talking about like the shallowness of mainstream pop rap and stuff. So, but I think Eminem, he transcends that because he did come out of the underground, which is about lyricism. It's about depth. It's about content. It's about really um, saying something that people can chew on. You know what I'm saying? And so he has that flavor to him. Uh, due to the unavoidable boundaries that came with being a white rapper, he decided the easiest way to win over an underground hip hop audience was to become a battle rapper and, and improv against the MCs and clubs. So if you're a battle rapper, you have to be witty. Um, Artin is really into like battle rapping. He can tell you a whole lot about these witty, smart, comedic 
battle rappers. They're very intelligent, man. You know, I mean, almost geniuses in the way that they can say something on the spot about you and make it comical. Think about that, man. That's like huge. You know what I'm saying? So again, um, I think I think society in 20 years will look back at hip hop as an art form and say, whoa, you know, like you look at rap art, it's like, man, there's so many like layers and textures and themes and images and arrows and words that you don't, sometimes like you have to, you have, you have to know how to even study graph art, you know what I'm saying? And like I'm saying, we're yet, I think in 20 years they're gonna have college courses, which they already do at UCLA, USC, uh, some of the Ivy Leagues on hip hop, but in 20 years they're gonna start looking at the art and saying, man, they were saying a whole bunch of stuff in this stuff. And we just looked at it as like a pop cultural, you know, bunch of little ghetto kids are messing up our cities, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I think it transcends that, and I think Eminem proves uh, the sophistication that comes with communication through rap and some of these MCs, because he says things that no one has been able to say in a way that really like, makes you think and go, whoa. And we're going to look at one of his songs today, and we're going to talk about how it relates to Christmas and Christ. Uh, a debut, uh, his debut record came in 1996. Uh, Infinite broke his artistic rut, but received few uh, reviews as compared to the Nas and... and uh, uh, I think it's supposed to be Jay-Z, but Jay is, is gone. Okay. Uh, came unfavorably, uh, undaunted, he downplayed many of the positive messages he had been including in his raps and created Slim Shady, the character, alter ego, who was unafraid to say whatever he felt. I mean, that's very smart. Uh, tapping into his innermost feelings, and this is what I like about Eminem, is he's able to touch his emotions more so than any other rapper. Most rappers only talk about objects and, and things, you know, cars. that's why I hate game. You know, I don't hate him, but I hate his is there because he's shallow. He just talks about cars and bling and True. women. It's like, come on, that's easy to talk about objects that everyone else is talking about. You know what I'm saying? But to touch into your core feelings and to bring it out in a way that people can say I relate to that, that's like the Psalms of David where he's like, God, I just want to kill my enemies, you know? Uh, he said he in some of the psalms he's talking to a soul. He's like, soul, what's wrong with you, soul? I mean, you, you, you know, like how many of you guys have experienced that where you're talking to yourself because you're so lost in yourself? You just like you're like, soul, what's wrong with you? Come on, believe in God. Believe, come on, cheer up, be happy. But you just can't seem to muster up in your heart the ability to be happy and to be right with God, you know what I'm saying? Or to have that open communication because your soul feels lost. Eminem kind of does that stuff, man. The conscience, the soul, his anger. Um, so he was able to tap into his innermost feelings. He had a bounty of material to work with when his mother was accused of mentally and physically abusing his younger brother the same year, around 96. The next year, his girlfriend left him and barred him from visiting their child. So he was forced to move back in with his mother and experience that fueled his hatred toward her and made him even more sympathetic towards his brother. So, the context of his fame is that he was going through hell in his home. And I don't agree with everything he did as far as, you know, talking about some of the crap and things that he went through uh, with his uh, mom and the way he kind of bashed her. I don't care how evil she was, but he did it. And now we have to confront it. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you know, it's just out there. You can't stop uh, the voices. You know what I'm saying? You're, just, you're either going to close your ears or you're going to say, okay, what is it I'm hearing? And how does this relate to God and the world and, and me touching the world? You know what I'm saying? And again, that's what I'm, we're trying to do this, this last few months as we ended 96 was to bring a whole new way of thinking to Unshakable. That is, we are not going to retreat and go into our little <coughs> Christian Unshakable church club. You know, I eat with Christians. I dance with Christians. I go to movies with Christians. I only talk to Christians. I have my little Christian safe little world and I stay away from evil, wicked, worldly people because if I get too close to them, they may contaminate me and I may not love Jesus anymore. I think that's insecurity in your own faith. People who operate like that are unsure about their own faith and how they live with God in private and in public. You know what I'm saying? And Jesus was not insecure. He was not retreating. He was engaged. He was touching people with leprosy physically dangerous. He was with sinners. He was eating with them and accused of being a liberal who just allowed anything. You know what I'm saying? And again, that's always going to happen. You know, uh, I was in a discussion with someone as I was speaking, like, well, you know, I understand what you're doing and everything, but, you know, uh, 
you know, um, but are you uh, are you um, accommodating these people? These people, you know, what I'm saying, no. There's a difference between saying I want to. Let me tell you something. In Acts chapter nine, Peter is up on a rooftop and he's, and he's praying, and suddenly he has a vision. Many of you guys have read that story where he sees. Um, animals, a bunch of four-footed animals and things that Jews were not supposed to eat. Things that were not kosher and clean, okay? And suddenly in the vision, God says, Peter, uh, do, uh, do not call what is clean, unclean anymore. And then in the vision, Peter says, well, Lord, you know, I've never, you know, done that. He's, and then suddenly the vision leaves. And simultaneously, there's a man named Cornelius, okay, in Caesarea, who in his prayer time, an angel appears to him. It says, this is Acts chapter 9. Go home and read it. And the angel says to Peter, I mean Cornelius, send down to Joppa, where there's a man named Peter who will tell you the message of the new life. So Cornelius was a centurion, a Roman, uh, in a sense, captain or general over a uh, hundred soldiers. Basically, he sends his servants, he's well off, to Joppa to ask to look for a man named Peter. Okay, the, the angel that tells him where he's staying at, a man named Simon, uh, the, 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 uh, the leper's house. So I don't know what that's all about. But uh, he goes there, and basically Peter is on the roof meditating, and suddenly he hears the commotion of these men who are looking for him. And the spirit, it says in Acts, tells Peter to go with the men. Okay, so there's this subjectivity where the Holy Spirit says, okay, go. So boom, Peter gets down. He's like, "Okay, I'm Peter. What's up, man? You know?" He's like, "Well, our, our our master Cornelius sent for you, for you to come back to his house. Something about you're going to tell him a message of new life." He's like, "Whoa, you know?" So he starts walking, you know, on this day's journey back to Caesarea up north, and he gets up there, and basically um, he's about to step into Cornelius' house, and, and he's like, "Okay, everyone, I've never stepped in a non-Jewish person's home before." in a Gentile's home. God told me to come here. Okay, I mean, I, I had a weird day. I had a vision of all these pigs and, and animals that I've never eaten before that is ceremonially, religiously unclean. And God's talking about, you know, grub down and eat them, Peter. And he's like, man, something's going on. Now God's telling me to step into the house of this filthy Gentile, in a sense, as, as, a, as, as a good Jew would have thought. And so he steps in, he's like, you know, what's up? So Cornelius and his whole family, everyone's sitting there. They're ready to hear it from this Jewish missionary. So he gets up, he's like, okay. And they tell him, Cornelius tells him, okay, this, this angel told me to send for you, da 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 but something about a new life. And he's like, okay. Boom. Starts talking about Jesus and how Jesus is the foretold Messiah. He died on the cross, he resurrected, they witnessed him. And basically there's forgiveness of sins in his name. As Peter is preaching, Something is happening in Cornelius' heart. It's like, amen, amen, amen. He's just like, yes, I'm, I'm understanding because everyone understood that the Messiah was going to come in the future according to the Old Testament prophecies. And here, Peter is saying, Messiah came, he rose, we witnessed him. And then something happens in the home. Something Cornelius, it says in Acts 9, and everyone in that house began to speak in tongues. And Peter's like, whoa, this guy knows nothing about what happened to us in Jerusalem a few months ago where we were in the upper room and suddenly this image, this vision of tongues of fire came and then suddenly we started speaking in languages where all these spectators, because the upper rooms would be open where people could see, okay, they weren't upper rooms in a sense of closed, the upper room would be like on top of a roof in a sense. And they're, they're up there, and all these people are watching them, and they're just laughing at them. Some are like, whoa, what's this going on? They're praising God, and our, our foreign, they're, they're Jews in the diaspora who've learned different languages. And all these Jews, in their, uh, in their new native, not their native language, but their uh, language that they speak and are hearing them in Arabic and Armenian, and all these different languages, Greek. I don't know if Armenians in there, but I threw it in there. <laughs> I'm going to make you feel good. You were part of that tongues phenomenon. See, Armenians are Pentecostals. Next, it comes. <laughs> Actually, there is part Pentecostals before. One of those languages was Armenian. So that's a whole different subject I won't get to. But what's the point I'm making? I don't even know. I forgot. Uh, I forgot like five minutes ago. I'm not joking. Uh, the point I'm making is, let me go back. 
was that it has something to do with this. Let me see. Diving. Confronting the world. Oh, diving into the culture. Thank you. Thank you. The point I was making was that we. He, oh, no, this is the point I was making. It was no. This point was so deep that I forgot. Okay. This is the, this is the okay. Listen to me. This point is so deep that I forgot because I've never even made this point before. This is a fresh, original point. You guys are getting it. Is this on camera? Camera. This is YouTube. This is original for you. Okay. I've never even made. I just learned this point this week. This transformed me. Okay. So this is like be happy, fresh manna. Okay. Look. Check it out. The point I'm making is that Peter went there to try to change their life in this Gentile, this foreigner. Hold on. You know what I'm saying? He went there, I'm going to go and help the outsider. But if you read Acts 9 carefully, in his dialogue and encounter with Cornelius, he not only was helping Cornelius, but God through the encounter with Cornelius in Peter's life was stretching his understanding of God's international mission, his theology was being stretched. And I would like to submit to you, as you interact, make a conscious decision in 2007 that you will interact, you will go to clubs, you will go to places, you will join the Armenian, you will join clubs, you will go places, that not, and you will go there not to, I'm going to go there and help these poor lost, dying, stupid people who need Jesus and I got the package. But you will go there with no intention to lead anyone to Christ. <coughs> Pastor, you're going, you're going far up. This is what I'm saying. Go with the intention of actually learning from them. And I guarantee you in the process with that kind of humility, they will ask you about your Christ. Because you're so interested in them. And what I'm saying is that, that every single human being you meet, if you kick it with me, you're going to learn something. But guess what? If I kick it with you and I really get into your mind and heart, you're going to stretch me. I don't care who you are. When I came last night, all the guys, we, we hung out and stuff and we chilled. Man, I'm telling you, every time that I hang out and chill with the guys, when they leave, something has stretched in me. I've had to confront things that I may not necessarily like, but are there. I have to deal with their perspective of certain doctrines, of certain ways of doing things, certain cultural realities. It doesn't matter whether I agree with it. In that interaction, I may think I have it, but they confront me with the reality that sometimes I don't have it, but I hide behind this false, un this false Christianity that says, well, I'm living obedient to God. Sometimes the critic who says, F you and your church, can teach you something about what your church isn't doing. You see what I'm trying to say? So when you listen to people, whether they're extremely antagonistic towards you, or they're just like, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not feeling unshakable, I'm not feeling you, I'm not feeling church. And you listen to them and just not, they're teaching you literally what's the problem with you and your friends in the church. And, and how out of touch you are with who they are, or how you're not even answering their questions. You're, you're over here speaking about apples and pears, and you're over here thinking about steak. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, like I go there, and I'm like, like you guys are just like, what, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing back there? Well, you, guys, you guys meet three times a week and sit in a room and... and... <laughs> You guys, like, you guys play music and you guys are like, why can't, you, why can't you do that at home? That's it, it puzzles them. Why can't you just put a CD at home, call some friends and just be like, yeah, Jesus. Be in the mirror like, you know, and have more fun with it. You guys go, you guys, you guys go to the place, turn the music on, you guys are like, um, I got them. Jesus. You know, it's like, what are you guys doing for two hours? I mean, two hours for me on Sundays, like football, NBA's about to come on. Maybe we have some beers and chill and, and, and do, do some quarter bonds. And you guys go there at one o'clock. You guys go there at one o'clock, one p.m. in the middle of sports, and you. And this guy talks about something. You guys are like, hey, 
What you talk? I don't even know what the guy talked about. That black Armenian just talks and talks. I don't even know what he's saying. <laughs> right? That's our experience. We don't even ask ourselves, are we learning something? We're not even engaged. And we treat people like we have something that we really don't have. When in our interaction, they can teach us. Interacting with Eminem can teach you a whole lot. Interacting with Soprano. Interacting with every human being. Get off your, 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 your fake, phony, Christian podium and get real with people. Listen, Cornelius taught Peter that God, love, and work of salvation is outside of just the Jewish community. And Peter's still strong because he was racist. As far as he was concerned, he was ethnocentric. The Jews were God's chosen people. We have the package. And years later, he's still struggling. Read Galatians. Peter had Paul has to rebuke him. Because you know what? These deep-seated beliefs, these worldview perspectives that are ingrained in us, even though God may be trying to stretch us through people, some people come here and they're like, I don't like that black pastor. He just rubs me. I mean, he's like, he makes me uncomfortable. I guarantee you, five years from now, one day you're going to be saying, oh, I understand. Some of us don't want to be stretched. The classes I like in seminary are the ones where I leave like, just, man, I hate that professor. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. But you know what he's doing? He's just challenging you. Bam! Bam! And you know what? I may disagree with him, and there may be even some falseness in his views, but there's some kind of truth that I'm not getting in the way that I'm understanding their views or even how to deal with people like that. Some of us, we want to go to little Christian colleges. We want to deal with only Christians. We want to only have Christian friends. And we and we are absolutely ineffective in touching people's lives. We go, well, it's, you know, it's God's love in me. Okay, I understand it, but all your friends also love God too. And how is love going to help you keep a conversation with Joe? How is love going to keep you in a place where you understand Sally as she listens to Eminem? Because I don't listen to that stuff. You don't know anything about it. How do you even conversate with her? Again, learning, having this posture of learning with people, like Peter was confronted through Cornelius, will make you powerful. And I'm telling you, man, we got to get away from that. we got to be able to sit at the coffee table with, I don't care if the guy's a racist Armenian or if he loves Eminem or he smokes weed every day. got to sit at the table with them and respect them and just let them teach you why they're like that. I'm not saying it's true and it's good, but the constant confrontation of where people are really at in the world around you, the world does not revolve around you. Christianity and uh, you're the center of everything. As far as they, as they smoke weed and listen to their G unit, and they're at that hotel party, the world revolves around them. Your job, you have a circle, is to come into their circle, and these circles to merge. You see, you, here's your circle, your Christian circle. You put merge with, and then like all these circles overlapping, and now you're in every, you're in these different circles, learning from all these different perspectives, and now you're, if, if your circles in different people's circles, guess what? You're touching people. But if you only have a circle, and you only come into other Christian circles, and other Christian circles, guess what? You're only touching Christians. And you're only learning from Christians. And you're not learning the mission of God to the world. Because you're scared to be a missionary. So, basically, he was pissed off. And you know what's interesting about Eminem? All the issues he had was with women. So you can see why he's very... Uh, uh, very uh, mis misogynistic. He's just like, you know, I hate women in a sense. You know what I'm saying? Um, and also, uh, okay. uh, uh, the material he was writing was uh, uncharacteristically dark as he began to abuse drugs and alcohol at a more frequent rate. An unsuccessful suicide it was the least straw, was the last straw as he realized uh, his musical ambitions were the only way to escape his unhappy life. And you could really see that. Like the guy pours into his music. He probably spends like a week just doing one song, you know? I mean, Tupac, much as I like Tupac, and I disagree with some of Tupac, 
he was noted for being able to write a song in like 10 minutes. You can tell that. I don't care. His, his lyrics are not as well crafted as Eminem. Tupac said a lot of stuff, but I, he doesn't impress me, his lyricism. It's like, he listens to it, like, okay, yeah, I, I like your passion. His interviews are better than his uh, songs, if you ask me. If you want to scrap about it, we can take it outside. Ooh. I'm not joking. But all you Tupac uh, jock strappers, um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, basically, um, but I can, in Eminem, what I see is more intensity. He's more, he's more intellectually engaged with this music, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I think that's why he sold more albums. And I, I think his whiteness has kind of affected him because <laughs> hip hop is still a African American Latino uh, uh, genre in a sense. And uh, your authenticity is characterized. I don't care who, who says what. Your authenticity in hip hop, and, and you know, believe me, just listen to some of the Armenian rappers, is of how black you can be. Oh, God. <clears throat> okay? And then they'll sit here and talk about blacks. I, it just confuses me. That's like, even like, why did John express this? Hi, the chimps he did. Black guy speaking Armenian, and he says he doesn't like Armenians. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> this guy is falling, you know? It's like, I, I, I don't get that one. That's like Seinfeld comedy right there. Uh, you know, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, those niggas, you know? It's like, whoa. Alright, okay. Uh, unsuccessful suicide attempt was the last straw as he realized his musical ambitions were the only way to escape his unhappy life. And you can see that. I mean, he's into it deeply. He released the brutal uh, Slim Shady EP, a mean spirited, funny, and thought provoking record that was light years ahead of the material he had been writing beforehand. Um, people allowed him to escape through Slim Shady because Slim Shady was an alter ego. What Marshall Mathers is like a whole different issue. It was, it was him. And he said things in that that we're going to look at today in this, in this uh, thing called uh, Oh, you put my um, music thing on? Okay, we're going to listen to this. Dread. 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 Hey, Dread. Yes, sir. Dread. Dread. Just a few questions. Um, Number one, um, what is the theme for all you M&M &M experts of the Marshall Matters LP? Can anyone tell me? What's the theme? What seems to be the thing that runs uh, consistently through the album, some of the thoughts and issues that M&M &M addresses? Revenge. Revenge? Okay. Revenge? Revenge? Is there something uh, more... Uh, can, you, can you say that? Uh, the more like the he, he always he always kind of um he's very detailed about how he's gonna like curl him or like see about the guy giving his girlfriend and yeah. killing his wife and his mom and stuff. Just he's kind of playing out this fantasy in his head so okay. he doesn't actually do it in real life. Okay. Uh, uh there's a lot of response to the critics. Excellent, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Arthur? And he actually switches characters from Slim Shady to Martian Mathers, and he does it by naming his album actually. Okay. Because he has the Slim Shady character going So the theme is more authentic. Voice. It's more of his authentic self? Yeah, he is more of himself, and, and like, he gets into the real world, you can say. Because but it's Slim Shady, not him, also. It is, but he's, he's dealing kind of in the real world, because okay. in the other albums, like. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of kind of fictitious kind of. Yeah. I'm gonna Scenarios do this and, yeah. in this one because he's been criticized a lot already for his both yeah. albums and, and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of talk going around, so he kind of tries to deal with that a lot. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think there's some karma. Karma? Okay. A lot of this, what goes around comes around. Circus. Um, I would you say uh, the main thing is is pain, uh -huh. causing pain and giving pain and seeing and yeah, the pain of life. And he portrays yeah. it in like, like sand, you know? Like, yeah. uh, he portrays it in pain. You know? Very and Shakespearean. Yeah. Very Shakespearean. Huh? Anyone agree on you? Theater? Any yeah. theater buffs in here? Theater? Shakespearean? All right, what are you teaching me? Uh, Nothing. Nothing, huh? <laughs> uh, any, any other themes that run through this Marshall Mathers LP that some of you guys may be familiar with. 
Yes, sir. Um, the CD, it has a few other songs, like this one, like uh, Marshall, it has that song, Marshall Mathers in it. Mm -hmm. um, just Marshall Mathers. It has like, it's more introduction to a, to a different side of them versus the one before this, which was the Slim Shady LP, which had like the more fictional characters we talk, talking about. And um, I think who else said it? it was the controversial topics that that's really important. Yeah, yeah. But um, like the interesting thing that I always thought about this, like he has that uh, one stand, he has that stand song, right? Yeah. But I think it's a few tracks after that he has that uh, uh, one, other, one other song where he's like, you know, if you see me out there eating or feeding my daughter, I don't know. Yeah, you know, so it's a really yeah. interesting, like two views that that there is there, like. I don't know, yeah. that was a trip. Well, no, I was in high school, this guy was a trip, you know. Yeah. Hey, what is, the, what is this picture of the album cover say about the theme of the Marshall Mathers? My question was, you know, what's what's the uh, theme of the Marshall Mathers? How did, I mean, whenever you, you, you study a book or you get into a book, there's actually a book called How to Read a Book. First thing you look is the, is the book cover. Then you go to the table of contents and you look at the book, the end of the book, this paragraph. Sorry. What is this? say about Stan and the theme of this album. What is this, his positioning right there against this kind of back alley Detroit wall? Is it a cake? No, he's so just hard. Hard. He can't see it. Fetal position? What is a fetal position? Oh, Represent. In his, he wants to be... Um, Give it up. Comforted? He can't be no, comforted. Okay. He's on the floor. He's on the floor. He's on the floor. He feels hopeless. He feels hopeless. He's kicked out of his house. Hold the fight. I've been kicked out of one of my friend's house. I ain't going to no alley, you know? He looks like someone's trying to kill him. And he's and he has nowhere to go. There's no trash cans to hide in or behind. I know this stuff. He looks scared. Okay. Um, okay. Look, I, I, I think Eminem is a deliberate artist. Everything he does is intentional. Everything. He thinks about it. I think the album cover says a lot about what his theme of the album is. He's defending himself. He's protecting himself. Something... It's almost like, you know, it's those scary movies, you know that w movie with Tom Cruise, uh, War of the Worlds? Yeah. Like, like, some, like some kind of alien monsters come and, 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 he's, and he has nowhere to go, because in that movie he couldn't go. I mean, if you were in a certain circumference of the alien, they just like, I don't know, they said like some kind of radar thing and he just, he just disintegrated. And I mean, that movie freaked me out and stuff, you know? So please don't bring it over my house. Um, but basically, I, 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 I almost think about stuff like that's going to happen in the future. Um, so I, I would say uh, that the theme of the Marshall Matters LP is, and I'll talk about it later. Uh, second question, um, what is the song stand about? What is the song stand about? What is he saying in this story of this character? He wants attention. He wants attention? Okay. Yes. Um, it's a response to, like Kaji was saying, it's a response to the critics because you got, um, okay, I, I did a report on uh, Eminem in, uh, for my senior project in high school, and I, all the critics who were against him, basically he had two main critics, Christians and the gay and lesbian community. And Christians, when I say Christians, when I say Christians, it's, 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 it's Religious people, that's, that's yeah. what I mean. You know, people who go to church and stuff, and they criticize them over, you're like affecting our, our kids and this and that, you know. They're going to commit suicide or go shoot up a school because of yeah. you. And, and what he's doing is, his, his verse at the end is very encouraging. It's, it's not him usually, like the way he writes, you know. The whole song is about, about this guy who's, who's saying some wrong stuff, but yeah. he's a fan. And he's trying to kind of straighten his path, and he's saying, hey, you know, I'm not that evil guy you guys portrayed me out to be. You know, like, I don't care about anything. He's like, I really care about my fans and stuff like that. Like, you know, he's given out his... his so that, so that, that, the, the album cover of him, in a sense, he's scared. He's, he's, he's in a fetal position. He's 
protecting himself, but he has nowhere to go because he's exposed. The alley has no other objects he can hide behind. It's a dark kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a shady alley, you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 and I think it says something about the theme, and this song is just one argument for what he's trying to do. As Hutchie said, it's a response to the critics. Yes, sir. What I see is like on the picture, he's, uh, it's a dark alley, but there's a light on him, so it's, he's under the spotlight. He stands out, and even though he's like in a favorite position, he's like he's weak, but he stands out. And the song yeah. is about this fan that is uh, that can relate to him, that the people who can relate to his song. And how, like, how much, how far they take you to, and how, and how they uh, change, had screwed up their, yeah. You know, they, I mean, it's, it's not because of him. It's because of the life that they live in, mm. and uh, it's just he, he's the one who relates to them, and they get that that relationship from from just listening to the song, and uh, basically he wants to help them. It's not that he wants, like critics, you know? Mm -hmm. He wants to help them, he doesn't want to think. But sometimes he just, yeah, he just can't. Lala, any, any thoughts on this? Ray, any thoughts on the song, Sam? All right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, now? Um, I have a thought that Besides that, like, I think Stan knew about Marshall Mathers' lifestyle before he became a rapper. Mm -hmm. And he was living the same lifestyle. He's like, my wife is pregnant and mm. such and such. And I think he related more to the lifestyle than to the song. Okay. And he bleached his hair in Marshall Mathers' color, like in the video and such and such. It's the lifestyle that he's singing about. But he's not really living that right now because he's making millions of dollars just by rapping. That's, that's, that's deep, girl. Go ahead. Mm. That's good. You got interpretive skills. Stan, I think.